So 15 years of humans living on board the International Space Station, a lot has happened, um, not only just building the station, but of course to its true purpose, scientific research. I'm joined here today by Dr. Tara Rutley, an associate program scientist with the International Space Station program to talk about it a little bit more. Now Tara, just first off, thanks so much for joining me here today, I really appreciate it. And I mean, 15 years, that's that seems like such a long time, but I mean, even in the scientific world, it's not always necessarily that long, is it? No, it's not. You know, I was a baby when I came to work here in 2001 at NASA, mm -hmm. so we were just getting started with the space station, and it's been really fun to see all the types of science uh, come across over these 15 years. And it is standard for science. Yeah. So back in the year 2000, the first crew got on board, three crew members, a much smaller station back then, but it was already equipped to start doing research. What were, what were some of the things they were doing, you know, 15 years ago? Yeah, the, the most important things are the things that we care about most, and that is really observing the Earth. They got started mm -hmm. right away with that, and doing lots of studies on the human body, how the body responds to spaceflight. And those are the two things that are most, most close to us. In fact, a lot of people don't know the first publication, research publication result came from crew Earth observation observation on the oh, space wow. station. So there you go. Trivia. Very cool. And so, I mean, there, we've had over 1,700 experiments, you know, and counting in the 15 years since. Give, give everybody down here just kind of a sense of how much can actually be going on on board the station just on any given day. On any given day, they'll have a full day's worth of science. It's, I mean, it's their job. They're doing this all the time when they're not sleeping or, or maintaining the vehicle. But a lot of people don't know that in a six month period of time, mm -hmm. our crew members can be doing about 200 to 250 investigations representing hundreds of scientists around the world. So those, those crew up there are doing lots and lots of good things for us. Okay, and one of the things, so one of our favorite phrases is off the earth for the earth, and yeah. that kind of came from one of the big reasons that we're doing all this science and one of the big benefits that we're getting out of all this science. Explain yeah. that for me. Yeah, I mean, there are things, you know, if you think about science in space, there's lots that happen physically that allows microgravity to, uh, to unmask some of the effects that we see in normal processes here on Earth. Mm -hmm. So it's really a, a unique opportunity to study fluid behavior, um, changes in the human body, uh, the way fire behaves, combustion, um, lots of lots of different things. And so that we take advantage of that unique laboratory that you can't get here on Earth, and we do those experiments and we do them not just to benefit those who, of us who want to go further and explore space, but really we get a lot back here um, that we can use on Earth, a lot mm -hmm. of new knowledge that we can use to apply changes to the way we maybe design medicines or, or materials and things that affect our everyday lives. Okay, you touched on some of them, so let's, you know, let's dive right in. Let's yeah. kind of go through the list. So 15 years, what are, what are some of the areas that we've really been exploring, some of the things that have come out of that? I think one of the neatest new areas uh, to come out of space station use uh, that benefits Earth are enabling the, the commercial industry to access space. So we're looking at now entire companies whose business is space. They send um, investigations to the, to the space station, they provide access for other companies, and they just, um, you know, enable the commercialization of the space station, which mm -hmm. opens up research to everyone. And that's through the National Laboratory effort. Okay, and what else going on? Another one um, that we really like is the uh, the water purification efforts. Space Station, you know, you've got to keep your astronauts fed and give them water, clean water to drink. And some of the efforts that came from building the system for Space Station clean water have been now applied commercially and used all around the world in areas that can take um, water that's from rivers and lakes and pass it through this system that is now gravity fed, ironically, uh, requires no power, and these guys can get clean water. Uh, it's drinkable around the world. Uh, protein crystal growth is another really um, interesting use of microgravity because in space you can allow uh, these crystals, these delicate crystals to grow nice and large. And why do we care about growing crystals? Because lots of proteins in your body, um, we don't understand how they work. And if we can grow them up in crystal structures, really nice, unique shape, we can get um, better benefits about you know, how to make better medicines and how to attach these proteins. And so our, our Japanese colleagues actually were successful at sending protein crystals up into space, growing up a particular protein that's involved in the progression of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, finding out things they hadn't seen before here on Earth, and were able to make more potent forms of the treatment of oh, wow. Duchenne muscular dystrophy. It's in trials right now. 
the um, ultrasound. You know, not not a lot of astronauts that go to space station are actually medical doctors, so there's they're going to need to know how to treat themselves in the case of emergency. So we've had ultrasound techniques that have been designed to train our astronauts and telecommunicate with them um, in medicine in space that have now been actually applied to here on Earth and. It's, it's new techniques, software programs that allow doctors, maybe here in the U.S., to treat patients across the globe in areas that don't have access to um, high, highly sophisticated imaging um, studios. Improved eye surgery uh, with spaceflight hardware. There was an investigation that was looking at eye tracking in space. What about this for spaceflight? What's different with our bodies in spaceflight? And so new hardware that was designed to really watch how the eyes move, and that affects balances and frames of references, um, was actually, as it turns out, could be applied to here on the ground. And it was. It was taken and applied to commercial use, and it helps surgeons now um, who are treating, who are performing eye surgery, track the eye movements, track the laser of the surgery, during uh, during the surgery, uh, the robotic arms um, that you know the the spaceflight arms, the Canada arm mm -hmm. that we see on station, and 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 um, the the Dexter were developed by Canada, and um, the makers of that that device have actually applied it commercially to a brain assist uh, brain surgery assist device. Now these guys can do, um, doctors can do surgery on the brain in areas that you can't access otherwise. You've got to get through an MRI device. Some tumors are so hidden, you can't see it unless it's in an MRI. The materials, the, dex the, te the dexterity, the textile function of this robotic brain surgery device allows surgery, uh, surgery to happen from across the room in an MRI, and patients, dozens of patients have already been treated uh, using this device. Oh, wow. Bone loss. Bone loss has been a, a problem in space. You know, you either use it or lose it. Um, and in space, there's not a lot of use because they're not walking around. So we see a lot of bone lo mass loss. Um, but what we found over the years of space station research is trying out new techniques. And we found that <clears throat> if we increase the, the astronauts' vitamin D intake, we increase and make sure they take all their calories. And they use the new, what you see here, innovative resistive, um, advanced resistive exercise device, or ARID, high load, high impact, then we've been able to maintain bone mineral density. And that is a huge breakthrough for not just our astronauts, but for those on the ground who um, are aging and are looking at facing potential osteoporosis, take these things into consideration. High load, take your vitamin D, increase vitamin D, and eat all your calories. We also see, um, we also are able to use other, um, what we call model organisms such as mice, to uh, look at changes in the bone density losses and maybe apply new um, medicines and treatments such as um, the company uh, that produced the, the form of medicine called Prolia. It's used now in osteoporosis in treatment on the ground. Some of their work was done on space station to lead them to that kind of use for us today. So also interesting um, are some of the changes that we're seeing from the bacteria that are on the space station that we send to microgravity. Some of these bacteria uh, tend to become more virulent or more aggressive. And in some, you know, some don't do anything. But what we've seen in some cases, such as Salmonella, is um, a model now that we can send these bacteria up to space, expose them, get them home, and look at, you know, look at the genes that have made them more virulent in space. What is it about the microgravity environment that could make them more aggressive? And when we understand that, we can apply it to uh, vaccine development here on Earth, and that's just what we're doing. We've discovered new ways to, to develop uh, potential vaccines for those of us here on Earth. So we've also been able to, through the 15 years of space station research, impact over 43 million students across the globe through programs such as YouTube Space Lab and Sphere Zero Robotics. They're usually uh, inquiry-based projects that allow students to be involved in human exploration uh, through science, technology, engineering, and math. So uh, you know, this is our future, and, and there's something always ongoing with space station and students' involvement. Breast cancer treatment, much like the um, the brain surgery device, now there's a breast uh, tumor treatment device that is stems from the same creators of, of the, the Canada robotic arm, and now we can uh, surgeons have been able to perform clinical trials of breast cancer remover within an MRI environment. So again, just imagine doing surgery while the patient is actually inside an MRI. You can't do it with people. You can do it with robotics that have the right dexterity and the right type of materials, and that's what they're doing. 
monitoring water quality from space. This is a big one. The um, hyperspectral imager for the coastal ocean, or the HICO, was an imaging sensor on the space station that helped detect water quality parameters. Things like clarity, water clarity, phytoplankton concentration, distribution of, of germs, cyanobacteria, in the water. It was built by the, the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory and put on station, but then there was a partnership with the Environmental Protection Agency that was able to take data from that instrument and apply it to now a smartphone application where now users can help determine places in where water is contaminated, places you wouldn't want to go swimming in. And now that we've got that kind of information, it it's, um, it's allows you know more access for people to get to clean uh, places of clean water. Water. Finally, don't forget Space Station is an Earth observation platform. It can, pop, it can cover up to 90% of the Earth's populations where we can monitor things like disasters such as floods and fires, volcanic eruption, deforestation. The ISERV project um, allowed us to do that in partnership with the U.S. Agency for International Development. So um, what, what happens is we can get images from Space Station, and we have, and been able to dis disseminate them around, from around the world, not just automatic, autonomously, but with crew uh, astronaut um, interference as well, and allows us to do that. So, I mean, that's just a tiny picture of everything that's been going on. And just real quick in closing, I mean, 15 years in the books, what's, what's the next 15 years of human research and human spaceflight research going to look like? Yeah, I, I think the next 15 years of space station utilization is going to cover both, you know, more applications on Earth, and of course it's going to do what we need to do to advance us to explore beyond mm -hmm. low Earth orbit. But the thing is, it's going to take time. Science allows for science to be repeated and publications come through, so we'll be seeing publications and results from space station come through over 15 years and beyond. All right, well, very exciting again. Dr. Tara Rutley, one of the uh, associate program scientists for the International Space Station. Thanks so much for joining me today. It's a big day. Really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you guys so much. It was fun being here. All right.